Good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Our guest speaker this morning is Peter Myler. He's um, going to talk about Richard Pierpoint, Lemieux Brown, and the fight for freedom. And it's appropriate because February is Black History Month, and uh, we're very fortunate to have um, Peter here. Peter Myler was born and raised in the Fergus area, north of Guelph. He worked in the forms management, freedom of information, and privacy fields in both government and private industry until his retirement two years ago. Peter has been researching Ontario's Black history since 1995. This has resulted in numerous articles, presentations, and two books, A Stolen Life, Searching for Richard Pierpoint, and Broken Shackles, Old Man Henson, From Slavery to Freedom. He currently lives in Brampton. So I'll turn it over to Peter. Uh, thank you very much. I, I want to thank you for uh, inviting me to speak about two of St. Catherine's earliest settlers. And actually, one is actually, you could call a founder of St. Catherine's. And that is Richard Pierpoint. And I'm, I, like I, I said before, I, I was born in Fergus and grew up in that area. And in 1983, Fergus was 150 years old and it was an old Scottish town, still very proud of his Scottish heritage. But we found out that there had actually been a black settler in that area before the Scots even arrived. And so that intrigued me. So I did some research and in 1994, after, ten, after more than 10 years, I, th I figured the historical society or someone would put up some sort of marker for Pierpoint, which they didn't at that time. So I just arranged, arranged a, a program through the Heritage Foundation for local marking where you, you raise matching funds and they would uh, match those. So this is a picture of the plaque, which is put up in front of the school that I went to, John Black Public School. Now, when the book came, when Fergus found out that Richard Pierpoint had a settler, was a settler there, they didn't know where his property was. But so when I did the research for, to get the plaque, I found out his property was right across the street from our house. The school is in the middle of his property. That's how close that history was to me. And we had no idea it happened. So when I found out his history and what he was like, I figured that he's worthwhile to do a book on because I didn't want this history to be uh, to be lost again. And it ended up in this book, A Stolen Life, written by my brother David and I. But we could only do it because of the petition he had written in 1821 because it mentions three very critical things. It says where he's from, Bondu in Africa. He was captured at the age of 16. It was sold to a British officer in America in 1760. So we get a place in time. Without that, we couldn't do any research. And so Bundu was a small country, about 30,000 square kilometers and about 30,000 people. And you see, it was now part of Senegal. Senegal on the African map is in red. And then the map of the Senegal area, you see Bundu in this map from the 1800s. It was a small Islamic country, but it was a tolerant country. Uh, people could practice different religions. But one interesting thing, all boys had to go to school. And it was a local religious leader who would teach them. Of course, that was in Islam. And so, you know, they think that Africans couldn't read or write. But Pierpoint, when he was captured, was 16. Boys went to school usually from about five years old to 16 years old. So he obviously then could read and write Arabic because you had to be able to do that. That was the language of the Quran. And so luckily there was two important books we had that told of this little country, Bandu, which is you know, such a random thing to happen. One was by an American professor who, professor who did a PH, his PhD on Bandu. And that's where the book Pragmatism in the Age of Jihad happened. And the other one was about this man, Jobs, son of Solomon, who was captured about 30 years before Pierpoint, but managed to have benefactors buy him from his uh, owners in the States. And he ended up back in England where they did this painting of him. And he actually managed to get back home. Pierpoint was not so lucky. He was, and he got caught up in the Atlantic, transatlantic slave trade 
And so once you were captured, you were put into what they call coffles. Usually two people were tie, attached together and then with ropes between them and they were marched to the shore. They estimate that maybe 20 million people were captured and about 12 million actually embarked on ships to the Americas. Now, this is a building that exists off the, off the capital of uh, Senegal. It's called Gore Island. It was built a few years after Pat, uh, Pier Point was captured. But you see this little door out into the water on the picture there. They still call those the doors of no return because the little boats that would take the people to the, the captured people to the slave ships would come up to those windows. They'd load the, uh, the cargo, which were people, into the slave ship and they would never return. So this happened to Pierpoint. He ended up in 1760 in New, or we, we think New England, because he was bought by a British, British officer. And of course, what was happening then was the French and Indian War. And that was part of the, probably the most important war related to Canada's history, because 1760 is when this was the war between Britain and France around the world. And that's when Canada became uh, an English or a British colony. So you can see from his warm sub-Saharan uh, weather and, and uh, location, he ended up in likely New England because there were a lot of Pierpoint uh, soldiers and officers in that area. Uh, this is actually in New Connecticut, or in Connecticut, New London, which was a small slave trading post. But this is a house from that time period, and Black people lived around this area of New London. And you see the painting with a British officer and his Black servant. Uh, most officers would have a, well, all officers would have a, a manservant uh, who take care of their horses, maybe their weapons and things like that. And Pierpoint's age was perfect for that. 16, he's young enough to train. And, and uh, he's, uh, and he, but he's not a, a full grown warrior who's uh, got a, a chance of causing problems and escaping. So the very first record we get of a black man who's enslaved is from the 1780 advertisement was put, that was placed in the Pennsylvania Packard packet and advertiser. It says, was committed to my custody the 23rd of October last, which was 1778. Two black men, one was James Hayes, the other one was named Richard Pierpoint. He says he drove a team in the Continental Army. And they have a, a, a description of this Richard Pierpoint. It says, Richard Pierpoint is about 26 years of age, about five feet, three or four inches high, has large eyes and thick lips. Seems fond of strong liquor, but is very biteable, or very civil and biteable. So that's a, if it's him, like you can never really peer point, uh, you know, say that that is the Richard Pierpoint, but it's such a, an unusual name and it's in the right area. So there, these two men were held in the jail and this picture is actually from Sunbury. Uh, that, that building is actually from that time period. Um, the basement is still from the original building and those little windows at the bottom was where the jail was, where they were held. So the jailer of course had to uh, keep these men and had to hire them out because he was, re he was responsible for their costs while they were in jail. So quite often they would hire out uh, jail, um, jailed people to make money to pay for the, the upkeep. So Sunbury was a very important area for during the American Revolution. Butler's Rangers and Six Nations were very active in Pennsylvania, just up the river from the, up the Susquehanna River, which goes um, right past Sunbury. And there's an American fort there, Fort Augusta. That's probably where Pierpoint and the other men were first taken when they were captured out in the woods. And that wall uh, that you see in the background of the sign, that's on the edge of the Susquehanna River. <clears throat> now, they were causing a lot of problems for, um, for George Washington and his army. <clears throat> they had um, 
Now, John, John Butler, who was head of Butler's Rangers, and Joseph Grant, who was uh, the head of the Six Nations Warriors in that area, were considered bloodthirsty savages. They were, the, they were considered terrorists of the day. So George Washington had General Sullivan have an expedition to go up to Susquehanna to try to destroy, as they say here, the Iroquois Indians who were the Six Nations. Now, this Butler's Rangers, to see how effective they were in that area, um, they had on a, th a three day er uh, excursion in that area, north of Sunbury, they destroyed 13 mills, 1,000 houses, and 600,000 bushels of grain. So that, especially the grain especially was very um, damaging for Washington because that was the food for his troops. Now, the British offered freedom to black enslaved people if they joined uh, their forces. So the very first official record we have of the Richard Pierpoint we know from, uh, from St. Catharines was from 1780, where he's a member of Butler's Rangers and he's stationed at Fort Niagara. And the interesting thing too, at that time, in the Vitaline records, which is the records they kept for who's coming for food at the fort, he had a woman with him. We have no idea at all um, who she was. So he became a member of Butler's Rangers. Now, for a reward for people who had served with the British was uh, land grants. So Richard Pierpoint was only about one of 10 Black United Empire Loyalists, because you could only be a UEL if you were Black, if you served with the British forces during the war. So he got 200 acres, which are in the middle of what is present day St. Catharines. Uh, they actually named it Creek after him, Dix Creek which shows he had some status in the community. Uh, his nickname normally was Captain Dick. Uh, in 1984, St. Catharines put up, um, uh, or, or members of the community put up a, a provincial heritage plaque for Richard Pierpoint. And the park that it's in now was last year was uh, named, is going to be named Pierpoint Park. Now, the black community had a hard time in the St. Catharines area uh, getting work and um, quite often the wages were half of what a white person would get. So in 1794, they had a petition to uh, the Lieutenant Governor to try to get land together so they could work and help each other out. And that was turned down, but you, you can see that there was a community developing. Obviously, you, if you have a group of men getting together, there, had, there obviously were meetings to define the problem, come up with a solution, and actually have the petition written for the government. So, and Pierpoint was an important part of that community. So we don't get much records. Um, so, there's not a lot of records. There's, the only record we have of Pierpoint in between is land records. In 1806, he sold one of his lots in Grantham Township, and he traded one of the lots for a lot in Louth Township on the lake. Uh, we don't know, and the interesting thing with the Louth Township one, his name all of a sudden disappears from the land records without any sale, record of sale at all. Another man's name shows up about eight years later. Um, so the next record we have of Pierpoint is when he joins the Colored Corps in the War of 1812. And he had actually initiated or he had suggested to the government that they form an all black militia unit in the Niagara area, which they did. And September the 1st, 1812, he joined as a private in the Colored Corps. And they fought at a number of battles throughout the, uh, the War of 1812. They were at Queenston Heights where their officer was, was commended for, their ser for the service he made, which obviously meant that the Colored Corps fought very well there. They also fought at Fort George where the description of the fighting was that they, they were from six to 10 yards from the American troops at um, firing at each other. So again, very dangerous. There might've been a Stony Creek and Lundy's Lane, but the records are very scant. 
So again, he was 68 years old in 1812 when he joined. So he, he must have been a tough guy. So yeah, this is the battles that they had uh, uh, fought at. They were stationed at Fort George for a time. The Americans, of course, finally came over and took over Fort George and did a number on it. And Fort George wasn't very safe because they could actually fire. It, it was pretty easy to fire into it from Fort Niagara across the river. So they built a, a new fort, Fort Mississauga. And when we were doing the research, my brother and I, we realized that Fort Mississauga was actually built by the Colored Corps, even though there was no acknowledgement of that anywhere. Uh, they had become an artificer's corps, which were the ones who did the construction type work. So it was very dangerous and dirty work. They also helped, um, you know, worked on Fort Niagara, um, fixing it up after it had been uh, destroyed during some of the uh, parts of it had been destroyed during the war. So that's the last we know of him in the War of 1812. Now, soldiers were supposed to, militiamen were supposed to get six, six months worth of wages eventually. Well, that never happened because as usual, the government didn't have money to do it. Um, so in 1820, they announced that they were going to give land grants to militiamen. Now, you know, you realize 1821, Pierpoint uh, petitioned that he didn't want land. He wants to go back home. Well, that never happened. So he got this land grant in Fergus or just outside of Fergus in Garifraxa Township. So he got that in 18... Well, he had it settled by 1825, built a cabin, had cleared the five acres, and obviously, obviously with help from other people at that time. And one of the people we think who might have helped him, and is like the help one, was a man named Lemuel Brown. Because this is the last will and testament. It was written in 1828 in Niagara. So you can see Pierpoint moved back and forth between Garifraxa and Niagara area. And he left all his property to Lemuel Brown, um, and you can see that you can see that's the uh, Pierpoint's actual mark. That's uh, about the only actual physical remnant we have of Pierpoint. So the will was probated in 1838. So we know that Pierpoint probably died in 1838. He would have been about 92, 93 years old, still living, had his property in Garifraxa. Again, like I said, probably moved back and forth. Now, Lemuel Brown and his wife didn't need the property, so they sold it a year later. But I didn't know much about Lemuel Brown at all. I, you know, I knew he lived, there was a land record, or a census record from 1828, where there were seven males and three females living in a household in Grantham Township. Now, the males were older people, so I figured one of them was probably Pierpoint, who was living with him at that time. So... I did this, I edited this up other book called Broken Shackles. Um, and when it came out in 2001, up in Collingwood, uh, the library had a little book raising. So I showed the book of Stolen Life to someone I knew, Janie Cooper Wilson here. And I showed her the will and tears there came in her eyes. Lemuel Brown is her great, great grandfather. So I finally found out where Lemuel Brown went. He ended up in Artemisia Township out in Gray County. So this was a great thing to find. Then about six years ago, another thing happened. Someone I know, Hillary Dawson, who's a genealogist and a researcher in Etobicoke, she was looking at this article, uh, this magazine from 1907 because of this article called, article called Uncle Tom's Prototype. And what caught her was this, the name Lemuel. It said a well-dressed, intellectual looking, white-headed colored man. So she was wondering, could this, be, could this be Lemuel Brown? So we finally found, well, I read it and I thought, yeah, this is definitely Lemuel Brown. So he was born in Vermont, which was unusual that he was enslaved there because the constitution in 1777 said that ended slavery, except for the loophole was you could be a, a child slave. So Lemuel Brown was a child slave and I'll just read the, the first part from the story where you get some of Lemuel's actual words. 
He says, I was born in the state of Vermont. I did not know my parents. My earliest recollections are of a family name of the name of Paige, who took care of me and treated me kindly. Now, eventually though, he was, uh, went to work for a man named Gould and who owned a hotel in the town where they lived. And unfortunately, it doesn't say what town it was in the article. Uh, but Gould eventually wanted uh, Lemuel to stay on permanently. So what happened was they, um, they signed, uh, filled up papers and eventually Lemuel realized he had been bought and sold and he was now owned by this man named Gould. Well, Gould one time, after an, a few years, took Lemuel, had Lemuel tie, uh, get the wagon ready with his two, two bay horses to drive him and a friend to Lake Champlain, where his son and uh, captain of a ship uh, would trade out things up Lake Champlain. They, they managed to entice uh, Lemuel to go on the ship as a little boat, a sloop, I think it was, uh, to take a look. And he went downstairs to look under, you know, see the cabins down below. And when Lemuel came back up, he was, the ship was out in the middle of the lake sailing away. So Lemuel was afraid and crying and screaming. So they said, oh no, it'll be okay because you'll, you'll just, we're just going to bring you to um, uh, Bissell, who was a American officer and uh, who was at Sackett's Harbor. They, he was one of the groups who uh, tried to attack, well, came into upper, uh, upper Canada, tried to attack and take over that part of the province, uh, but were driven away by the Canadian militiamen along the St. Lawrence River. So Lemo recounted that, recounted that uh, he was a large slaveholder and speculator in slaves. And this is his description, Lemuel's description. His treatment of recent purchases was oftentimes harsh and cruel, though I tried to do the best of my ability. Many, fa many failures brought many whippings and many, my lacerated back and shoulders caused me many sl a sleepless night. So it was a bad situation for Lemuel. Now, uh, eventually, uh, Bissell got promoted, then was stationed at Buffalo and one of his friends uh, was the um, quartermaster whose name was Captain, it was a camp. And um, this camp and Bissell like to gamble. So one night they're gambling away and Lemuel becomes part of the bets. He's wagered. And so camp wins and Lemuel then becomes owned by a camp and moves in with the camp family. And again, not a very nice uh, person. One thing we know, and this is interesting, he, um, so you can get a timeline. Uh, Lemuel recalls that he was actually at the Battle of Chippewa. They sent them in to get um, the harness and saddle off of a horse, one of the American horses that had been shot and killed at the Battle of Chippewa. Well, while he was out there, Lemuel got hit by um, a ball in his leg. So he, he, he was out of, out of commission for a while, but it was a pretty well spent ball, so he recovered. But uh, this is just one of his descriptions of camp and as a cruel master. And this is shortly after, he says, shortly after I resumed duty, I offended camp by a trifling neglect. He seized the whip and came at me in a perfect fury. Look, my clothes are stripped off. I was tied up by my thumbs to a tree so that my toes just touched the ground. Camp himself laid on the lash until he wore it up. Then he got a wagon whip and laid it on until the blood ran down into my boots. So that was the treatment of, of Lemuel. So eventually he realized he had to get away. Now he was at Camp's household. There was another a slave man and another boy about his age too which I, I think was probably about 14, 15 years old at the time. Um, and they had talked about escaping. Now, the other boy eventually did escape. And of course, Lemuel didn't know what happened to him, but they always heard stories that the Canadians and Indians on the other side of, a ri of the river would kill and scalp anyone who tried, who would escape over there. But because of the treatment was so bad, 
uh, um, Lemuel decided to take the chance. So he took a log, an old log boat he knew about because he he was uh, you know worked for the quartermaster. He took that to the to uh, the canoes he uh, the canoe he used to uh, to go between the gunboats. He took that across the Niagara River in the dead of night. The only thing he took with him when he snuck out of Camp House was an extra shirt. So he's going down the river and he puts his hand in the river and realizes he's drifting down. And you know, drifting down the Niagara River, Niagara River is not a good idea. So he manages to, you know, get the boat going against, uh, you know, sideways to the current, gets across the shore and, um, and then he sees that there's a white man on a horse. So he's trying to run away from the white man because he's afraid of being uh, scalped and killed there. So, uh, but the white man takes him and he say, he, keeps, he keeps him until he, he kept him with him until he could find um, something for Lemuel to do. And that's how the story must have ended, I guess, the, um, the story in the magazine, because that's all we get. So we don't know what happened, but there's an important line at the end of the story where Lemuel says that he concluded on a, uh, the article by saying, on a farm in the township of Artemisia, I have lived, raised my family and prospered. So that's why we definitely know that that is Lemuel Brown, the one we know of. So the records we do have from Lemuel is 1828 census when he was in Grantham Township. Then we have this notice from the newspaper where it says, he wasn't going to pay for his wife, Rosanna, who has absconded. Two of these were placed in the newspaper in 1830. So obviously, if that's uh, obviously, it's got to be the same Lemuel Brown. His marriage broke up. And then because later, by 1838, he was married to a woman named Phoebe Brown, a Phoebe Workman. Um, and so this is the other record we have from Lemuel. It's from... It's where you be, uh, apply to become a British subject, so you get a, you could get a land grant. So in 1841, it shows him in St. Catharines. We know he was in Guelph Township when he sold the property in, in Garifraxa. Uh, it shows that he had a residence in Wellesley Township. That was part of the Queen's Bush Settlement, which was the largest Black settlement in Ontario in the 1820s and 1830s. Uh, we think probably about 1,500 people. And then we know he ended up in Artemisia Township. And, and that's why we know the article was written sometime before 1871. Because in 1871, he shows up in Collingwood in the census. But here we have his family listed it, that who was living with him in Artemisia Township. Now, the ages are really wonky in, in, in census records. Uh, you can never take them at face value because they can go up and down by 10 years easily. Um, someone will age 20 years over a 10 year period in the census record. So you have to look at it as a, an average and what it might be. But you can see he had some of his children there with him. And this is uh, a gray site of his daughter, Hannah, who is um, Janie Cooper Wilson's great grandmother. Uh, that's their, her and her husband. They're buried in, in Collingwood in the Presbyterian Cemetery. And this is the death notice of his daughter, Susan, who ended up living in Woodstock. She was a really well-known herbalist. Um, so she died in 1926. But she, it, the interesting thing where she mentioned is that she's the daughter of Lemuel Brown and Phoebe Workman, one of 17 children. So, you know, he was born with having no family. And he ended up having 17 children. So uh, he had a pretty good life at the end of it. So, uh, we, you know, it's important that Pierpoint was a, known as a griot. That's the storyteller, the history keeper. And so you see how some of these stories, it, once you have a record, then you can actually tell the story. And so it's, it's uh, very uh, important for St. Catherine's history that both of these stories managed to exist somehow because i'll tell you so the 1907 article so it was written sometime before 1871 and the the author william harrison was going through papers of his and obviously in his older age going through stuff and throwing stuff out and he came across the lemuel the lemuel story and he thought well this is interesting enough i think i'll actually keep that 
So it's just by chance that we managed to have the story of Lemuel Brown. So I want to thank you for inviting me to speak on this and uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, we'll open up to uh, questions if anybody has any, either from the uh, in the live audience or in the Zoom meeting. Yeah, I can hear you. Are you with, with us, Russ, to see how to answer any questions that uh, the uh, Zoom people have? Check, check. We've got a question here. Anybody online, if you just unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. I just wanted to ask a question about the, the Islamic backgrounds that you described. Sure. Was that, was that ever a factor in North America? I mean, was he uh, treated differently because of that, his uh, ability to read and write, say, Arabic or his knowledge of Islam? Well, they might not have ever known that. Because again, they might, it probably wasn't a good idea to let people know. But um, there, I mean, uh, a good percentage of the uh, enslaved people were, were, were Muslims. You can just tell by the areas they came from. So mm -hmm. it'd be, uh, there was a, uh, you know, there were Muslims here since the start. Here, a question. <clears throat> I lived in the Great County area for a while, and one of the things that I vividly remember was your Hanson book that you wrote. Um, and I also remember it being um, considered for a textbook for the schools in the area, uh, Old Sound. Did that ever happen? Did what happen? Did the textbook that you write on Hanson become? A, a reference book used by the education system in Old South area. Oh, I um, actually, I, I don't know. I, I think it probably has because it's pretty well known up there. I know that the publishers actually did a, a you know, um, a guide to use it for it for the Toronto School District uh, many years ago. But um, yeah, it's pretty well known, so I'm sure they use it as a reference at least. <laughs> Our, it's Russ Maland online. Are, are your books uh, still available? Well, no, Stolen Life. My brother David and I got the rights back from the publisher. So the publisher doesn't have any more. Um, but there are some, you can still buy them online, either used or, and there is a bookseller in Vancouver that has a number of them available. Um, the the other one, I, I should just mention this. I, I've been I was interviewed and part of a Black History documentary that's coming out on the History Channel as part of a four part series that starts the first episode. I think the way that it's going to work, the first episode is uh, February twenty six, and then I think my episode is on March fifth on uh, the History Channel, and then the next Friday, uh, the Friday after it the intention i think global tv might show the same documentary on the friday night so the publishers rushing to get a new batch of broken shackles um printed for that because the the person who the documentary is on is old, uh, john daddy hall who is is a, a prime character in broken shackles Very good. One, uh, just one hint I give to anybody who's written books or whatever, is if you have a clean PDF of the book, uh, you can just uh, put it up for free on Amazon. Right. Yeah. And Amazon will print it on demand. Or yeah. if you convert it into an ebook, which one of our members has done and says it's not, I think it, yeah, it was Ron that did it. It was pretty easy to do. Um, it's available to everybody for the forever. Yeah, and that's you get a percentage of the money. Yeah, my brother and I are, we want to do, and that's the thing, we went to the publisher, we want to do a 
you know, because the more information, you know, we've learned more, yeah. more information over the time. So we want to update the book. They weren't interested. That's why we were working on an updated version. I've uh, I've actually published a business book through Amazon. Yeah. And it's, it was a snap. No, I only have it printed on demand, but uh, oh, yeah. e-books are, I never did get to the e-book phase, but yeah. uh, it's yeah. another great possibility. Yeah. One of our members has done a history book of the Niagara on the Lake Railways, and he published it as an ebook. And he says it's now easy. It was hard when I tried to do it. Yeah. So just some feedback to you. And I'm really impressed with the research you're doing, et cetera, et cetera. I was really kind of blown away because I'm a, I coach and facilitate a historic research team at the Toronto Railway Museum uh, with uh, two old guys like me, two middle aged guys, and two youngsters, which is phenomenal. And we're trying to coach them into researching railway history. So I, I be, I'm becoming a great fan of, of this research stuff. I'm not a researcher. No, and that's a great, there's a great intersection there with black history. We're looking because into that. I, I yeah. don't know if it's worth talking to you about that. We, of course, know about the Porter connection, a Porters. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, Porters were almost exclusively uh, black cool. people. It was, uh, they thought it was a great gig, but I won't get into that. That takes it away from your talk. Yeah. But there, there are other connections, absolutely. If there are no other questions then, uh, thank you speaker. I'll call on Duncan to officially thank today's speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Peter, as part of my thank yous, I always try and get a takeaway that I can comment on. And my takeaway with you goes back to uh, your 1995 beginning. And what I mean by that is in 1995, diversity, that is black history and uh, natives and so forth, was not what it is today. And so you starting this was uh, very uh, interesting. And the other part of it is your you said, tell a story, you made reference to that. Well, you certainly did tell a story and you were motivated to tell a story. You weren't an author, you got together with your brother to help you and you told the story and you published it and you continued to update it and upgrade it and so forth. So we appreciate it from the viewpoint of St. Catharines because Richard Pierpoint probably should have been written by somebody in St. Catharines as an opportunity whether in 1995 or 2021, they didn't. And we thank you for you writing that and bringing the presentation. I will be mailing you on behalf of the club a $30 gift certificate by way of our Provost Club saying thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, now, call on John Sand to give us the official attendance.